4.2. All right. So we are studying the book of Leviticus. Like I said, we'll go for six minutes and 22 seconds, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, we're studying the book of Leviticus right now for two reasons. One, I want Rosie to understand the book of Leviticus. All scripture is breathed out by God, even Leviticus. All scripture is profitable, even Leviticus. I want her to know it. But I also want us to stay Leviticus because I want us to understand what Leviticus contributes to the big story of the Bible, because that's what we want to know. So we've looked at three themes in the book of Leviticus so far. We're looking at the fourth one right now, and we're talking about holiness. What we talked about last week is how we need holiness. There is a need for holiness. We're living in the presence of a holy God, and therefore we must be holy. Problem, we're not holy. And so that's where we're at 4.2. Let's look at the, here's your blank, the means for holiness. How is God going to make an unholy people holy? Well, I'm going to read you two verses. Leviticus 20, 26 is a command. You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord. I am holy. I've separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So that's a command. Charlotte Mooney, be holy. God is speaking to her. Be holy. But then Leviticus 22. And you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So according to Leviticus 20, who is Charlotte's holiness up to? According to that first passage I read, who is Charlotte's holiness up to? Remember I said it was a command? Therefore, whose responsibility is it? Say it, Rosie, you're right. It's Charlotte's responsibility. But according to Leviticus 22, whose responsibility is Charlotte's holiness? God's. I am the Lord who sanctifies Charlotte. So which one is it? Is it Charlotte's responsibility or is it God's responsibility? And the answer is yes. Both. It is Charlotte and it's God's responsibility. So let's see if we can figure out what the connection is. So here's how God, and, and this is so important, guys. This is not just for Leviticus. This is for you today. If you're a believer in the room today, this is for you. God's means, the way that God makes his people more holy, that's in Leviticus, that's in 21st century Birmingham, Alabama, right now in this classroom. The way that God makes his people holy is through a combination of past and future grace. Past and future grace. Now, we're given a clue in the way that the book is even structured. So, the first 17 chapters of this book deal with, here's your blank, substitutionary, S-U-B-S-T-I-T-U-T-I-O-N-A-R-Y, substitutionary sacrifice. So first, God graciously provides a way for their sin to be dealt with that doesn't involve them dying, right? The animal dies in their place. So first, substitutionary sacrifice. And then, after their sin has been dealt with, we get, here's your blank, ethical instructions ethical instructions and the book ends with blessings and curses based on how you perform in the future so i'm going to repeat that again so i want you to understand this the first thing that god does is he graciously gives a way for you to be forgiven through the death of a substitute and then he says okay since you have already been forgiven live like this today and as if that's not enough he ends the book by offering you promises of blessing or curses based on your obedience the past grace are, is the sacrifices that god offers you have been redeemed and forgiven the future grace is the promises of more blessing or the promises of more discipline based on how you obey so let's look first at past grace daniel if you want to raise your hand man you gotta Put it up there. Substitutionary or four two one two ethical e t h i c a l ethical. So basically, how you should live. Ethical instructions, how you should live in the world today. So let's look at past grace. So a person's growth in holy conduct is the here's your blank fruit is the fruit of one's acceptance with God. Do you remember my amazing apple orchard drawing from a couple oh, months ago? Yeah. What do we say? Life 
is evidenced by the fruit, but life is not. Guys, what, what, remember first day of class? If you miss a blank, don't ask your neighbor because now not one of you are listening. What's your question, Benjamin? You don't have one? What's your question then, Daniel? It was 4-2. Uh, 4-2 means, the means for holiness. So we said in my amazing apple orchard illustration, the apples on the tree are not the reason the tree's alive. The apples on the tree are evidence that the tree is alive. And the same is true in the book of Leviticus. Their growth in holiness comes after the fact they've already been accepted by God. And here's your blank, acceptance, acceptance, A-C-C-E-P-T-A-N-C-E-D, sorry, A-N-C-E, acceptance with God is only possible, one, by grace through faith alone. So God does not have to accept any of us. None of us deserve to be accepted by God, but we can be accepted by God when we place our faith in his grace. What specifically am I supposed to have faith in? In the, here's your blank, unblemished, unblemished, U-N-B-L-E-M-I-S-H-E-D, unblemished substitutionary sacrifice. So I can be accepted by God when I place my faith in his grace that he has displayed by giving me a substitute sacrifice to die in my place. And after our break, we will demonstrate that from the text. So let's take a three minute break. So we are looking at how God makes us holy. And we said it's through a combination of past and future grace. And so we're looking right now at past grace. So we can be holy today based on the fact of what God has done for us in the past. So there's only one story in Leviticus, and it's a story with a surprising ending. It's the story of the building of the tabernacle. They build the tabernacle, they sanctify and consecrate the priest, they offer the sacrifice, the fire from heaven falls, everybody worships, and the very next thing that happens is Nadab and Abihu go in, offer unauthorized fire, and die. So what are we to take from this very strange story? So first, we see that atonement, atonement, remember our sins being paid for, atonement is the way that we actually get to be in the presence of God and get purified and not get destroyed. So Leviticus 9, 3 through 4 in verse 6 says this, God says, say to the people of Israel, take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said, this is the thing the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. So God says, I'm coming to visit today. Remember what the Bible says about God. He is a consuming fire. So when God shows up in the midst of the camp, the people are either going to be purified, or they're going to be destroyed. And the determining factor is going to be, has your sin been dealt with? If your sin has not been dealt with, when God shows up, you will be annihilated. If your sin has been dealt with, you are welcome into the presence of God. And so the worshiper of God, the Israelite, Anna, me, every worshiper of God from all times must approach God through the death of a substitute. And when I do that, something happens in me. When I come to God, not by my own efforts, but through the death of a substitute, something happens in me. I now value God's holiness. I now delight in God's holiness. Where before God's holiness was scary and boring, now it's beautiful and desirable. Leviticus 10.3 this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. God, you will treat God as holy. And before all the people, I will be glorified. To put it another way, Yahweh's zeal. Does anybody know what zeal means? Nope. Benjamin, maybe. Super strongly about something? I like that, yeah. How about like this? Passionate intensity. 
So maybe you've got one of those relatives who every time they watch a football game of their favorite team, Daddy they're jumping father. up and down and screaming and fist pumping and yeah, they go to the games, they'll paint their face, they'll hold up the signs. That's zeal. Well, is this a football illustration or a question? Well, kind of. Okay. Show uh, me. So we were camping the other night in the um, Alabama, Texas scene, and mm -hmm. Jane was on, oh, and then it was like us. Uh, like the people were yelling. Wasn't there a pick six in the game? Yeah. Or was it like an interception? Something. Like that. Go well, on. and then they were like. Ah! And I heard it through all the camp. It was yeah, like, that's zeal. Yeah. So that's zeal. Well, Yahweh has zeal too. But Yahweh's zeal is not about Alabama or Auburn football. Yahweh's zeal is against, here's your blank, sin. So you can be zealous against something. Like I'm zealous against that book that's open in Palmer's lap, right? Like you can be zealous against something and you can be zealous for something. So Yahweh is zealous against sin and Yahweh is zealous for the, here's your blank, display. For the display of his holiness. And Yahweh's zeal is most clearly seen in the atonement. How do you know that God hates sin? Because he requires death to pay for it. How do you know that God is for holiness? Because Yahweh requires death to pay for sin to be in his presence. So when atonement happens, and this is, this is in the Old Testament, and this is in J. Dewberry's life as well. When his sin is atoned for by Jesus, it ignites something in Jay. And that should be a zeal against sin. So every believer in this room, are any of you sinless? No. But should all of us hate sin? Yes. For every believer in this room, our number one priority ought to be, and often is, for God's holiness to be displayed. And that's because God forgives every person who does two things. One, who, here's your blank, confesses, who confesses their sin. Leviticus 5.5, 5, when he realizes his guilt in any of these matters and confesses the sin he has committed, he'll be forgiven. And who, here's your blank, who trusts, who trusts Yahweh's willingness to punish the substitute. Now that should sound really familiar to you. Wait, wait, so you're telling me salvation comes when I confess my sin and I trust in God? Yep. That's how it came to the Israelites. Well, how did it come to me? Oh, when I confess my sin and I trusted in God? That's how God is always saved. God is always saved through a confession of sin and trusting in the fact that our holy God is also merciful and will punish someone else in our place. Sorry, what's the last blank? Four, two, two, five, two. Trusts. Now, in the process of doing this, God shows himself to us in a way that leads to holy living. But, here's your blank, death. Death comes to all who fail to take Yahweh's holiness seriously. Right? Nadab and Abihu, they offer an offering to God that's improper, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So, we are motivated towards holiness by past grace. Not just motivated, we are enabled, we are empowered. Since God has forgiven Story Kinsley her sin, he has given her a new heart, new desires, and she is able to live out the commands of God based on what God has already done. But that's not enough. God also gives us future grace, future grace. Now, how does this work? Is this like a time traveling movie? No, no. The last two chapters of Leviticus, Leviticus 26 and 27, specifically Leviticus 26, are a list of blessings and curses that God will give to his people based on their obedience. Because what was, here's your blank, hoped for. What was hoped for in the future would impact how people live now. Now, let me give you an example of how that might work out. Okay, let's just say for a second that my greatest ambition in life was to go skydiving. It's not, by the way. I'm quite happy on the ground, but let's just say it was. And let's say, furthermore, that there's a weight limit on skydiving that you can't weigh more than 200 pounds. And I realize that I'm above the limit. If I truly desire above all else to go skydiving, and somebody walks in here at lunch with a pizza and a box of cookies and says, here you go, Mr. Wood, 
if my greatest desire is truly to go skydiving, what will I say when someone offers me those pizza and cookies? Abigail? Um, no, thank no, thank you. Because what do I want more than pizza and cookies? Skydiving. skydiving. So what I'm hoping for in the future will impact how I live right now. So if I say that above all else, I want to go skydiving, but every time someone offers me pizza, I eat it. Do I really want to go skydiving more than anything in the world? No. So if we say we love God, if we say I can't wait to be with God forever, and every time someone tempts you to sin, you give in, do you really love God above all else? No. We don't. And this is how 2 Peter 1.4 puts it. God has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Why? Why does God give us all these promises about what he's going to do for us in the future? Why doesn't God just tell us what he's already done? Why, why, does, why do we need the future? Here's why. So that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You and I can fight sin. We can say no to sin because we are wanting something better than sin, something that God has waiting for us in the future. Now, that's the positive side of future grace, right? The blessings that God wants to give. But I said in Leviticus 26 and 27, there's a list of blessings. There's also a list of curses. And this divine discipline is also a means of grace. God telling his children, if you do X, I will punish you, is an act of grace. How? Well, at first, here's your blank, it softens hard hearts. Being reminded of what God will do to us if we disobey is a means of grace because it softens our hearts and it, here's your blank, nurtures, N-U-R-T-U-R-E-S, nurtures persevering dependence. If you will not listen to me and not do all these commandments, then I will do this. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consumes the eyes and makes the heart ache, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. Now, does God say that to them because he's just, he can't wait to do that to them? Is God saying to the Israelites, oh, I can't wait. You're going to disobey, and I'm going to give you panic. I'm going to send diseases. I'm going to consume your eyes. Ooh. Oh. I'm going to, you're going to have famine and drought and plague, and I can't wait to do that. Is that what he's saying? No. No. He doesn't want to do that. And so he's giving us yet another reason to obey. Guys, God doesn't want to discipline you, but he will because he loves you. And him telling you that, him telling Charlotte Mooney, Charlotte, you're my child. I love you. If you disobey, I'm going to discipline you. Is not God being a bully? It's not God trying to scare Charlotte per se. It's God giving her yet another reason. Yet another reason to obey. So let, let's get down. Let's get real practical. What if uh, Palmer forgets to study for her memory verse quiz tonight? And tomorrow she comes in and she's like, oh, no. My mom said that if I make less than an A on this, I'm going to get in trouble. I know story studied and she's going to make 100. I bet I could just look over and cheat. Should she do that? No. What should be her primary motivation for not cheating? That she'll get in trouble and she won't make that. <laughs> well, I don't think that should be her primary motivation. What should her primary motivation be? Story? Well, again, I, I think that's part of it. Maybe so then press a little deeper there. Um, that she wants to, she should want to take time on it and that she wants to learn it. So she should... All those are right. Let me help you out. I think her primary motivation should be I've been saved by Jesus to display his character. I don't want to sin because I want to show the world that Jesus is awesome. But if in that moment of testing, the only thing that Palmer can think of to keep her from cheating is I'll get caught and I'll get in trouble. Should she use that motivation? Absolutely. <laughs> and that's all she can think of. So if all an Israelite could think of, if an Israelite was about to go and worship an idol statue, and the only thing they could think of is, if I do this, God's going to send famine and drought on my land, and I'm going to be hungry and homeless. Okay, use it. Turn around and walk out. If that's all you got, use it. That's an act of grace. God giving you motivation not to sin. Hey, I'll reward you if you do the right. I'll punish you if you do wrong. That's grace. That 
is grace. Now, Jay's sitting over there thinking, yeah, Mr. Wood, but that's in Leviticus. I don't live in Leviticus times anymore. I'm a member of the new covenant. Praise God, Jay. Yes, you are. You all are. So what about holiness and us? Where, where do we come in? Well, Leviticus 18.5. You shall keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Now, you know, you know that the people of Israel as a whole did not keep God's statutes and rules. And therefore, they forfeited their right to the land. They forfeited their right to God's blessing. And the result was they were exiled. But God's not done with his people. He says at the end of Leviticus that because God is faithful to his covenant promises, he's going to do three things. One, first, here's your blank, address. Address the real problem of Israel's sin. And the real problem of Israel's sin, God says, is their heart. Look at the end, the last line of verse 41. Their uncircumcised heart is humble. Right? Our hearts are hard. That is the real problem. So God's going to address the real problem of Israel's sin. Second, Yahweh said that he would, here's your blank, display. He would display himself as holy through a restored remnant. He will show his holiness because God will be faithful to his promises. Third, God says he will, here's your blank, create. Create effective witnesses and new worshipers. Ezekiel 36, 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I pray for you guys every day. And one of the things that I pray for you on a regular basis is that you guys would be evangelists, that you guys would share the gospel with people. But do you know how I think, and I know this from experience, do you know the greatest way to encourage people to be evangelists? It's not to teach them evangelism tools, like, hey, have you learned the three circles or have you learned this or that? It's not to tell them you better evangelize. It's to make them excited about Jesus. Do you know what happens every day in this class and in every class during the break? Every day, there's going to be at least two boys talking about college football. And do you know why they spend that three minutes of freedom talking about college football? Anybody want to take a guess? Because they're boys, that's what they like. Yeah, they like it a lot. They're crazy passionate about it. They want to argue about it. They'll even use the word we we did this or we did that, even though they were pretty sure they were at their house watching it. Uh, <laughs> but nobody has to tell a teenage boy in Alabama to talk about college football. They love it. They can't help but talk about it. But if we were really excited about Jesus, what would we talk about all the time? Jesus. Nobody would have to tell you to share the gospel. People would have to tell you to shut up about the gospel. And yet, and I'm speaking to myself here. This is not just me looking down my nose at you. No one has to tell me to shut up about Jesus because I oftentimes don't say anything about it. But it ought not to be that way. We ought to be excited. And God gives us a new heart at salvation so that we're excited about him and want to talk about him. Owen? What does you Display. Well, today, God is still our primary means of sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. God still wants a holy people. But now our victory is possible because Christ lives in us. Uh, Carson, would you read Romans 8, 7 through 11 for us, please? For the mind who, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Keep going. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life is because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raises Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Because if you're a Christian, the Spirit of God dwells in you so that you will live a righteous life. Before you were a Christian, you could not obey the law of God. Now you can, but not because you got stronger or smarter when you became a Christian, but because the Spirit of Christ took up residence in you so that you can say no to sin. So our growth in holiness comes only as a, here's your blank, outgrowth. Outgrowth, that's the word out and the word growth put together in one word. An outgrowth of justification. So remember, when you were saved, that is the moment you were given a new heart. 
That is the moment the spirit of God was put inside you. And from that moment forward, you are to be engaged in the business of sanctification. Remember, sanctification is the process by which God makes us more like Jesus. And that's only possible if you've already been declared righteous by God. And our growth in holiness ends in, here's your blank, eternal life. Eternal life. The one who has died has been set free from sin, and now you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. And what's the end of sanctification? Eternal life. Obeying God, saying no to sin and yes to Jesus, is how I become more like Jesus. And sanctification ends in eternal life. One day, cat truly will be free of sin. One day, she will be just like Christ and will dwell with him forever, but that's a one day. In the meantime, we are all to work. We must work hard in our, here's your blank, pursuit. We must work hard in our pursuit of godliness. Sanctification is hard work. It is not easy to say no to sin, but we also must work not in a way that attempts to replace grace. I think 1 Corinthians 15, 10 is one of the most important verses in the entire Bible for every Christian. Because here, the Apostle Paul tells us the secret ingredients of sanctification. And there are two. I'm going to read this to you. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Here are the two ingredients of sanctification. God's grace your sweat. We are not to work in a way that says it's all up to me. Me, Caleb Pettigrew, I have to roll up my sleeves and bust it every day to become holy. God is watching and God is evaluating me and I have to impress him and show out for him. So it's all up to me. No, that's not what Paul said. He said, it's by the grace of God I am what I am. But we are also not to say, Caleb is not to say, what the hell? If God is going to be gracious towards me and God can't fail, I don't have to do a thing. I'll just sit up, sit back, kick back, relax, float down the lazy river of sanctification, and God will get me there because it's all grace, baby. No. What did Paul say? I worked harder than any of them. Yet it's not me. It's the grace of God that's with me. Your sweat, God's grace, this is how God gets us to the finish line. Hard work. Worthy work. So we'll finish there tomorrow. What page are we on? 22. 22. All right. Memory verse quiz is tomorrow, so be ready. Yay.